perhaps I should have done this section with the other one all at one time because I, I mentioned these broad categories, uh, but I was going to go through them. So some of the common issues that we spoke about was, does the seller have proper authority? Well, most of the time that should be fairly simple. When Bob Smith is selling the house and that name's on the purchase agreement, the underwriter is going to be able to see that the name is recorded as Bob Smith. Um, you do run into issues when there is a third per person or a third party person that could potentially not be who's there. So for instance, if it's a trust, there's going to be a trustee that may be signing for that. Well, that's going to be a problem because you're going to need the documentation that shows the trustee is in fact the trustee and that he would in fact have the power to sign for this trust. So the underwriter will have that issue to deal with and he will then, or she, would then seek out that document probably from the seller or the listing agent for proof, hey, I need this document s submitted too. Now that same concept is going to flow through to about any time a person that is not on title is going to be the one selling it. Uh, so anything that may be corporate owned, if there's a corporate owned piece of property, well, the president or the CEO may be signing at the closing. There's going to need to be some declarations that have to be submitted to the underwriter of the insurance to prove that yes, Raymond Modulin does have the power to sign for Real University Inc. All right, so there's going to be that documentation. In an estate sale, you may have a executor signing. I'm having one right now where it's the attorney has been named the executor and the attorney is signing all of the documentation. And of course, we submitted a copy of the will naming the attorney and the court documents to back that up. Um, there's another one on, that you will see probably more often than these that you may have to deal with is powers of attorney. All right. So someone that may be a seller has granted power of attorney to a family member for some reason, that power of attorney will need to be submitted to the title company when the escrow is opened so that once again, they know that they're not going to be seeing Mary Jane Jones, they're going to be seeing her son at the closing and they have the documentation of power of attorney. Now, power of attorney is pretty useful for sellers. I don't think I've ever closed one where the POA was for a buyer because most lenders truly want the wet signature of the borrower on there so that there's just one less potential issue of the borrower going, dude, that wasn't me. I didn't give that person POA. I didn't sign for that IOU. Go after so-and-so. So I have never seen a buyer use a POA um, in my 22 years. I've seen a lot of sellers do it, all right? Um, sometimes one of the spouses may be in military status and may be active duty and deployed. That's another reason you will see a POA. Once again, the underwriter, that's going to be an issue in that escrow process. So that underwriter is going to need to see that documentation. Uh, one of the other things that could pop up are clouds or defects. Is there a judgment listed against the seller or potentially the buyer? Are there any bankruptcies that the seller has went through or is going through? Or perhaps, yeah, that's probably the best thing I was going to say. There was hope in the past, but hopefully they cleared it up then. Um, because they need to make sure that the seller can actually give clear or what they call marketable title. So clouds can be issues. Most of those can be solved in advance. Mechanics liens, they can be an issue. Uh, they show up as liens, so there's going to be issues. The best way, once again, is to just get all of this through in that preliminary title work to see what's going on. Now, one of the categories that could cause issues, 
and really this isn't really much of an issue from the title company standpoint because there's really not much anybody can do is if a party gets cold feet all right if the party gets cold feet now there's two sides to this if the buyers uh, are the ones that are at fault then that earnest money needs to be compensation to the seller or could be compensation for taking the home off the market now the problem is if the title company is actually holding the earnest money and they don't get a mutual release signed signed by both the seller and the buyer they cannot be a directive to where to give the money all right was that clear no <laughs> she's shaking her head no <clears throat> so in the real estate world there is a process by which a disagreement of where the earnest money goes should neither party agree say the buyer defaults the buyer wants his money back the seller thinks he should keep it, so neither party signed the mutual release. Well, there is a process under the Indiana Real Estate Commission, as well as most real estate commissions, that allow for one broker, the one holding the earnest money, to write a letter to the other side saying, this is what I'm going to do, and you have 60 days with which to act. In that 60 days, it virtually forces the other side to file a small claims court and go in front of a judge and let the judge decide it. Should that other party not act within that time frame, then the listing agent, who's the one holding the earnest money most of the time, will actually do what he said he's going to do in that letter, which is probably give it to his client. All right? So that's in the real estate world. That's a real estate commission rule that's not a state law the problem is if the title company is holding the earnest money they do not play by real estate commission rules so that rule of i'm going to act unless you file a lawsuit does not exist so most title companies will retain the earnest money until one of two things happen either both parties agree and the title underwriter will get a mutual release stating the earnest money is to go to blah and they both agree or a court will decide and issue a court order to direct the earnest money to be given to blah that's virtually about the only two ways that title companies release earnest money when one of the parties get cold feet now, if the seller changes his mind due to uh, whatever, lack of heart or change of heart, um, or he gets a better offer, there actually can be damages filed by the buyer in that case. However, once again, that's probably going to be outside the spectrum of what the title company would do. Matter of fact, the title company would not even give the legal advice to that client because they do not provide legal advice even though there is an attorney usually on staff all right so if one party gets cold feet or the other pretty much the underwriter is going to be waiting for a mutual release agreed upon and signed by both parties short of that it's going to be a court directive as to where to guide the earnest money all right so not really any way to avoid that issue because you can't know why people change their mind at the last minute same thing with this next one if contingencies fall through um, really not much of a title company issue it is an escrow issue because remember escrow is the entire process so the financing fall through which is typically a contingency that's built into most states authorized purchase agreements all right i've seen colorado's i've seen texas indiana nevada all of them virtually say something about the contingency of financing if it's not approved then the entire deal gets uh return uh nullified and earnest money gets returned because it was an agreed upon contingency by the seller and the buyer the appraisal 
Now, I will tell you as we sit here in 2021, early 2022, there is a whole new thing going on now called this appraisal gap. Most purchase agreements have a clause in there that says if the list price, well, let me say it the actual way, if the appraised value comes in below the agreed upon list price, either party can terminate or they can agree to lower the price. So if we offer a hundred grand and the appraisal comes in at 90, in the old days, for us old whippersnappers, in the old days, they would just lower the purchase price to meet the 90, all right? That would be a contingency that is built into most purchase agreements, which would then could move forward. Or the other half is either party could withdraw, which would then obviously kill the escrow process, kill the closing, so to speak. Home inspection defects, you know, they could get under contract, they could find defects and not agree on the, the validity of the defect, the cost to repair or whatever for whatever reason, that could be an issue. Um, one way to avoid that in advance would be for real estate agents to actually understand the financing and understand the true condition of a property. You know, if somebody is selling a rehab special and they accept an offer from a buyer that's FHA, that is probably going to fall through in escrow because FHA has higher standards for the property to meet than say a total gut job rehab. So that escrow probably would fall out, but that could have been headed off at the pass way back at the offer portion because the listing agent should have not taken that offer to begin with knowing the condition of the property. Suppose the home isn't insurable. We talked about this. I can give you a couple examples. It may be problematic. Probably if the home comes back based on the underwriter saying this house is not going to be insurable, and there could be several reasons. One of them I mentioned earlier, maybe the bankruptcy wasn't executed correctly when this guy bought the house, the current seller bought the house at sheriff sale. Now, we do have a new statement inside of the Indiana Purchase Agreement, which actually asks, is this listing, was this listing acquired through sheriff sale, tax sale, something like that, and we have to mark yes or no, kind of as a heads up to the title company and the underwriter to let them know, hey, there, you make sure you want to check this because we're telling you our seller acquired it two years ago or six months ago through a sheriff sale or a tax lien sale or whatever because they have to go back and make sure that that process was done complete that they are not in the period, still at, somehow in a redemption time frame period. So that house could not be insurable. Now, if that house turns out to be not insurable, there's going to be a definite reason why, which in the long run can be solved probably and a new escrow reopened again, all right? so. When somebody changes their mind and the escrow closes out because the seller's not going to sell, yeah, there may be some legal issues, but that deal's pretty much dead. Hopefully, if the house be is found to be uninsurable because of something historically, we can rectify that issue and probably re-resurrect that deal once again so that the escrow can be reopened or a new account reopen for a further sale. All right, cool. Once again, questions, email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com. Um, we're going to take a break. You guys at home, just keep on going. You guys here, take 10 or 15 minutes. Let me fill my coffee up and we'll be right back.